This morning we're going to talk about kingdom principles. You know, this thing, this is probably going to get in my way. I might end up just moving this thing, you know. I might. I think I'm going to. You guys know me. You know that I, I, I like to move around. I like my space. I like my space. I need my space. So, um, kingdom principles, whenever I was praying, I just, I, I thought, Lord, when he, when he was talking to me about kingdom principles, I'm like, yeah, but that's kind of basic, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of surface level stuff. And he says, nothing I do is surface level. If you view it at surface level, that's up to you. You know, we can take anything that God has for us and we can go as deep as we want to go in it. And so, this morning we are going to, we're, talk, we're going to talk about kingdom principles, but we're, I want you to, I really want you to stay kingdom focused. It seems like God has really been calling us and drawing us to keep our eyes fixed on Him, to keep our, our hearts fixed on Him, our minds fixed on Him, because it's so easy for us to let, them, let our mind just drift and go anywhere. You know, it's so easy. I think about, you know, King David whenever he was a shepherd and, and, and just taking care of the flock. Out in the middle of the fields, sleeping under the stars, being able to spend so much time with God, just, just him and God, just communicating with him and God. And I think that God absolutely loved that. And David loved that, and that's what, what really um, developed that deep, intimate relationship between David and God. And God says, he's a man after my own heart. And he lived by kingdom principles. So I, that's why I say I, I really want us to stay um, kingdom-focused. Stay kingdom-focused. Don't get off track. Let's pray real quick before we start. Heavenly Father... Holy Spirit, help us to stay kingdom-focused in everything that we do. Amen. So, in, in just about every area of life, you want to have the mindset to be able to accomplish the things that, that God has called you to accomplish, right? And so, in, in my previous lines of work, it was required for me to have a warrior's mindset. But now in, in uh, the line of work that I do, I still have to have a warrior's mindset, but it has to be with a servant's heart to love other people, to be able to protect other people, to teach them. Um, but just having a warrior's, a warrior's mindset is not good enough. It's not. It will it'll do you great in a battle. It'll do you great in war. But we also have to stay kingdom-focused and kingdom-minded and love on, on God's people, right? So um, we have a, a warrior's mindset with a servant's heart. We are called to serve, but we're also told that every single day we battle, but not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of darkness. So we are always in a war. We're always in battle no matter what. And we need to balance that out with um, our relationships with people, with our relationships with, with everybody that we come in contact with. So we, and we're able to do that. God says that he gives us the ability to be able to do all things through Christ who gives us strength. If we try to accomplish these things on our own, even staying kingdom-minded, if we don't rely on God's strength, and His power to get us through every single situation and circumstance that we come into, um, then we're going to try to rely on our own strength, and we're going to fail. So stay kingdom-minded. The Word tells us to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. He tells us that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God and have no other gods before Him. Sometimes it's pretty easy to put another God before Him. We don't want to, 
right? It's not our desire. We don't get up in the morning and go, well, I'm going to put something else in front of God. But whenever you start fixating and focusing on anything else, and, and maybe you start getting worried about something, and you start trying to think, how can I do this? How can I fix it? How can I overcome this thing in my life? Well, it's time to take a step back. It's time to backpedal a little bit because he wants us to be, he wants him to be our first go-to, no matter what. He wants to be our first go-to. I love the verse that says, for it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And guys, if we could wrap our minds around that, if we could truly come into agreement with that, if we could truly get into the frame of mind where where I am a bondservant of Christ, I'm a slave to Christ Jesus, and I'm going to do what he says, when he says, where he says, how he says, do we realize, do we really understand where our lives can go? I hear people say, I'm trying to find myself. I, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to find myself. Well, you're trying to find the wrong thing. You're trying to find the wrong person. It's not yourself you need to find. It's God that you need to find. It's, it's Christ that you need to find living in you. Let him live through you. Then you'll be the greatest you that you could ever possibly be because he created you to be just that. That's what he created you for. I promise you, your version of you is not the best version of you. So if you find it, you're going to be disappointed. You know? You're going to be. Don't go look for you. Don't. Let you stay lost. Let you stay lost. I must decrease, and he must increase. I must decrease, and he must increase. Whenever we, anything that we do, we can do good things, We can do great things, but if we do those things so we get the glory, they're horrible. It's the worst thing you can do. Don't seek glory for yourself. We must decrease so that he can increase. One of the kingdom principles that we've got to truly understand is salvation. That's kind of the first, the first step into all this thing, right? Salvation and believing. The Word says that he who believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. And we think, well, that's simple. Well, is it simple? Is it simple to truly believe? To let all of your other beliefs disappear? Is that simple? To let go of, of how you were raised, the things that you were taught, the life that you lived before? Is that easy? Not generally. But to believe is to have a firm, full understanding, a foundational belief that no matter what happens, no matter what somebody else says, no matter what uh, circumstances you go through in your life, you still believe that God is God. You still believe that He died on the cross to save your life. You still believe that He has your best interest in mind, even if life isn't going great. If you believe in me, you won't perish. You're going to have everlasting life. Whether this, when this body dies, not, not if, but when this body dies, you step from this life to that life. From here to there. Just like that, in the twinkling of an eye, the Word says. That is outstanding. John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they know the one, the, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So this is Jesus praying to the Father. These are Jesus' words coming out of his mouth. The Son of the Most High God, God, the Son, Jesus, says this is eternal life, that they know you, God, Father, And that they know and believe that you sent me to this earth. That is eternal life. Because in that, in knowing him, in truly knowing him, that is where eternal life comes from. Can we truly know him if we don't care about learning about him? 
Can we truly know Him if we don't spend any time in the Word, in any time in prayer, talking to Him, communicating with Him? We won't know Him. We won't know Him. Guys, get that hunger, that drive, that desire inside your heart. At our prayer meeting this week, on Wednesday night, we were talking about this church and kind of, we went back to the beginning. You know, how did this thing start? And we started talking through that. Jerry um, ran us through a whole, like an awesome history of, of this church. But one of the main major key factors in the formation of this church, in the foundation of this church, in the longevity of this church, is prayer. Prayer is one word, but it's so huge. It's so vast. It's so important that you won't have life without it. You can't have life without it. You can't have life without communion with God, without communication with God. You can't. You might still have breath in your lungs. You might still be breathing and walking around, but you're a dead man walking. I'm telling you, you've got to have prayer. It's got to be foundational. Why do you think the enemy has come against this church so hard so many times? It's because we're rooted and grounded in faith, in the Word and in prayer, in a relationship with Him. That's why the enemy wants to rip us apart from the inside out. Of course he does. He wants to divide and conquer. A house divided cannot stand, right? Amen. But what can draw people together closer than prayer? Better than prayer? What can we do to draw us closer together, make us stronger, make us better, make us um, closer to God than prayer? Love? Absolutely. Love is absolutely foundational. And by loving you, I'm praying for you. By praying for you, I'm loving you. If I don't love you, I'm not going to pray for you, right? If you don't love me, you're not going to pray for me. If you don't love God, you're not going to pray to Him and talk to Him. Do we realize that His Son came and was brutally, brutally tortured and murdered so that we can talk to Him? That's why the veil was ripped in two. So now you and I can go into the Holy of Holies so that He can be with us and dwell in us and live among us and inside of us forever. Do you realize that it's His desire that we be with Him where He is forever? We know that that's a fact because Jesus literally spoke it out of His own mouth when He's praying to the Father. Father, I desire that they be with me where I am and see me in my glory that I had before the foundations of the world. That's Jesus' desire for you and for me. That ought to pump you up. If it doesn't, I don't know what to smack yourself, like pour some water on your face or something. Like that's got, that's got to be exciting. That the Jesus, the God, the Son of God is talking to the Father and He says, I only say the things I hear the Father say. I only do the things that I see the Father do. So it's the Father's heart as well for us to be with Him in His glory where He is. Why are we worried about what goes on in this earth? The pain, the hurt, the suffering, whatever. It's going away. It's going away. It's just going to be for a minute. Okay? It's not going to be here for very long. Don't worry about it. Matthew 18.3 says, And truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus saying here? Jesus, what are you, what are you saying? Fortunately, Brittany calls me a child all the time. Simple. I've already got it. It's great. <laughs> no, but what is he saying? When you tell children things, they believe you. Why would they not believe you? They take you at your word. They don't think you're lying to them. Why would they? What he's saying is, you have to take me at my word. What I tell you is truth. You've got to understand that I love you. Don't, don't, don't make it more than it is. Just, just love me. Just know that I love you. Come to me expectant that I'm your father. 
want to be with me. You know, I remember going home uh, whenever I'd be on patrol or whatever, and I'd come home, and, and the kids were little, and, and this was whenever the dog was waiting at the door and my kids were waiting at the door. You know, now just the dog waits at the door. What are you laughing at? But, but seriously, no, seriously. Kids, kids want to be there with you. They want to spend that time with you because they know you're going to wrestle with them. You're going to buy them ice cream. You're going to take them out and have fun and play and, and all this kind of stuff. And they know that, that you love them. They want to ride on your back. They want you to throw them up in the air. I can't wait to get everyone to be like, throw me. <laughs> you know? I would launch my kids, Brittany, my, my, my uh, in-laws, my mom. What are you doing? I'm like, they love it. Look at them. <laughs> like, look at that smile on their face. They're loving this. And I never did drop them. <clears throat> it wasn't a drop. She bounced off the bed into the wall. And she's fine. Look at her now. She's fine. He may bounce me into a wall once just to... I think he already has, though. I think I've already paid for that. Yeah. Here's what's cool, though. Anybody in here have, have kids that, that you've ended up giving, giving keys to the car to? You know, to be able to go somewhere, whatever, be able to go run around and have fun. And when they, when they get those keys, man, they get to go be footloose and fancy free. Dad's not with me. He can't see me. Little do they know. Dad sees everything. <laughs> but here's what's awesome. Jesus gives keys to the kingdom. He gives keys to the kingdom, and I'm not exaggerating. In Matthew 16, 13 through 19... Jesus' um, cousin, John the Baptist, was just beheaded. And he says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? And their, their response is pretty interesting. And they say, Some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah. Others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And Jesus is listening to this. Picture this in your mind. Picture this conversation going on in your mind. Jesus is strategic. I'm telling you right now, everything that he does has a strategy. Like he gets up early in the morning, he spends time with the Father so that he knows what to do, how to do it, when to do it, you know, all these things, so that he knows that he's doing what God wants him to do, the Father. And then he said, who do you say that I am? So he asked them this question at first, who do other people say that I am? So they get thinking about all these people that have told him, you know, what they've heard, everything that they've heard, and what other people think. And then he says, all right, who do you say that I am? So that puts a whole different spin on it. Because he wants them to understand in their heart what they believe. He wants them to know what they believe. He doesn't want them to question. He doesn't want their thoughts and their opinions tainted by the world. He wants them to think for themselves as humans, as adults, as lovers and followers of God. So who cares what they say? Now what do you say? Simon Peter replied. Of course, he spoke up first. Fortunately, he was right this time. <laughs> he says, you are the Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Good answer, Peter. Good answer. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, he changes something here, he says, I tell you, you are Peter, or Petra, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom. Verbatim, baby. 
He will give, he says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven or on in heaven and on earth. Seriously, Peter was a man. He was a human being just like us. And Jesus says, because you understand who I am, you understand the power and the authority that God, my Father, and your Father has given me, because you understand this, here you go. You get the keys to the kingdom, baby. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you um, loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm telling you, it doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't get any better than that. But he knows something. Jesus knows something here. He knows who Peter's going to be, what Peter's going to do, the life that Peter's going to live. He knows that he's going to fall. He's going to fail. You know, this is, this is literally right before, literally right before he tells all of his disciples that he's going to go and he's going to get crucified. And Peter, the same one that Jesus tells this to, says, absolutely not. This will not happen. Jesus knew that was going to happen. Jesus also knew that this same guy was going to deny him three times, deny that he even knows Jesus. When he's sitting here telling him, you are the son of the most high God. Jesus says, I'm going to build my church on you. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He knew that Peter would fail, but he also knew the beginning from the end. He knew Peter's heart. He knew that he could trust Peter. And because Peter had this deep conviction, this deep belief, this deep understanding, because all in John 17, Jesus says, like the whole reason that he's praying this thing is so that we can hear his heart with the Father's heart. And the main, the main point of all of that is so that we will know that God the Father sent Jesus, that Jesus is God himself, and know and understand our relationship with him. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. And if you think, if you think, oh, I want to get the keys to the kingdom. I want the keys to the kingdom. Give me the keys to the kingdom. I want to be able to do anything. And it's all about I I, 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 I want, so I can, so I can, so I can. You're not getting the keys to the kingdom. This is not about you. It's not about what you want. Unless what you truly want is what the Father truly wants. Unless what you want is what Jesus truly wants. Unless he's the most important thing. And if he is, you get the keys, baby, so that you can do what he's called you to do, what he's made you to do, what he's formed and shaped and created you to do, what he's seen you doing before the foundations of the earth. And you can. Another one of the kingdom principles is love. So glad that you brought that up. So when we believe in God, we have to know that God is love, and everyone who knows God is born of God, and knows, you know, uh, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But whoever doesn't love doesn't know God. That's a tough one. I know it's a tough one. But you know what, love let me ask you this. Does anybody in here ever sin? You don't have to raise your hand. I'll raise my hand for all of us. Because we've all sinned and we've all come short of the glory of God, correct? But the Word also tells us that love covers a multitude of sin. Isn't that good news? I need lots of it, Lord. Lots of it. He covers a multitude of sin. The Word says that God is love. So if love covers a multitude of sin... And God is love. God covers a multitude of sin. Jesus came to the earth. He bled. He died. He was buried. He rose again. His blood covers a multitude of sins. He is that great sacrifice. Thank you, Jesus, 
for your sacrifice, for the love. Love is one of those kingdom principles. Without love, what are we? Nothing. Nothing. Like a clanging cymbal, the word says. You know? Just, you ever, you ever just heard somebody over there? Just clanging on a cymbal? It's like, I'm going to smack that person. You know? That's what it's like without love. And forgiveness. Forgiveness is another huge kingdom principle. It was, while I was putting this together, you know, I almost, I really kind of wanted to put forgiveness first. I kind of did, you know. But faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these is love. It kind of made me put love first. But I'm telling you, forgiveness has got to pull a super, super, super close second. I think that love gives you the opportunity and the ability, the power, the empowerment to be able to forgive. I think that that's why God put love first. His love for us allows us to love. That we can love because He first loved us. It's biblical, you know. That's the only way that we truly can love. That's the only way that we can know love. And really the only way to be able to honestly, truly forgive someone else. It's not about the someone else. Forgiveness isn't about the someone else. The forgiveness is about you and your love for God and your obedience to God because God said forgive them. And you can do that because he's poured out his love into you. And you can do all things because he gives you the strength to do all things. Does forgiving somebody mean, hey, what you did was fine. It's okay. What you did, it's okay. No, it's not okay. And forgiveness doesn't mean that you're admitting that it's okay. That's not what it means. It means that you release them from that. You ask God to cleanse you from unrighteousness, from the the bad thoughts that you've had against them. You know, Jesus says, um, he's telling them whenever uh, he's talking about um, lust and hate and all these things. He says, if you've even um, hated someone in your heart, then you've committed murder. It's those kinds of things, you know, but God gives us the strength and the ability to forgive. It's not about what, it's not about somebody else. It's not about the action that they did. It's about God wanting to heal you, to restore you, to take that pain away from you, to let you walk in freedom Because your unforgiveness doesn't hurt them. I promise it doesn't. The cold shoulder, the, what do they call that? The fifth fifth degree? The fourth degree? Some degree, whatever that degree is. Anybody know what that degree is? Whatever it is. It doesn't hurt them. They don't care. It only hurts you. And so that's why it's so important. That's why it's a kingdom principle. Forgiveness is a kingdom principle. Did you know that God said... That if you don't forgive those who have sinned against you, you won't be forgiven. It's not, you might not be. It's not, you, you might be. No, it's, you won't be forgiven. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, whenever He teaches us to pray, He says, pray like this, and He starts telling you how to pray. And for, um, forgive me my debts as I forgive those who have sinned against me. Forgive me my sins of, as I forgive those who have sinned against me. Jesus lays it out that it's very clear that we have to do it. We don't want to do it. And honestly, I, I'm sure that probably everybody in here has somebody that they're thinking about. They're like, I think I've forgiven them. God, you know I've tried to forgive them. So... Because Nathan's saying it up there, God, I forgive this person again. You know what? It's okay to walk through forgiveness with people multiple times. Brittany and I had to do it just the other night. Literally. From years ago. Hurts from years ago. 
It's like picking off a scab. You know, somebody says something, reminds you of something, reminds you of an offense, something that they did against you or your kids or your family, and it's like, oh, that person. And then you just go back in your mind. You go, God, you know what? I release that back to you. God, I give that back to you. Help, help heal my heart, God. Help me to forgive them again. It's okay. It's okay to ask him multiple times for something. Okay, I promise. He wants that. He wants you to talk with him. Forgiveness is absolutely huge. Another kingdom principle that's absolutely huge is giving. You know that God so loved us that he gave his only son, the son that he loved more than anything in the whole wide world, he gave him because he loved us so much. Giving is a kingdom principle. And you know what? The way God does it isn't in this little box. Did you realize that? He tells you to give extravagantly. You know why? Because he gives extravagantly. He wants you to be like him. He wants you to understand that the principles of the kingdom of heaven are not the principles of this earth. They're not. We think, well, I can't give because if I give, I won't have enough. If I give, I won't have anything else. And he says, no, you give it, and I'm going to take this, and I'm going to dump it all back into your lap because I'm your provider. I'm Jehovah Jireh. It's not about what you have. It's not about what you give. The woman that gave the two mites, I think they call it, like that was all that she had, and Jesus said, that woman gave more than everybody else. She only gave two little pennies. Wouldn't make a difference to anybody. Probably couldn't have even bought a, bro- a loaf of bread. But Jesus says, she gave more than anybody. And because of that, because of her faith of stepping out and doing that, she's going to be remembered throughout all time. Throughout all time. She's blessed. Imagine the place that that woman has in the kingdom of heaven. He says, this is how backwards the kingdom of heaven is like. It's how backwards it is. The last will be first, and the first will be last. It's like all the kids line up for lunch, and this one kid didn't make it there in time. Oh. And God says, no, you're going to come up here. The kid that wants to let everybody else go first, go ahead, go ahead. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. And then they all get up there. They're getting ready to cut into this big beautiful cake. And God says, all right, everybody ready? And the kid that's up there at the beginning, yeah, I got here first. He goes, nope, you're back here and you're up here. That's the kingdom of heaven. Guys, his principles, they don't make earthly sense. They don't. But that's the great thing about our God. That's the great thing about our God. He says, like Lonnie was saying, test me in this. Test me in this whenever it comes to money. This is, giving is not just about money. In fact, it's probably very, 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 very little about money unless you put all of your hope, faith, trust, and love into money. Then it's probably all about money for you. But if you don't, it's probably very little about money. What all can you give? What all can you give? And Jesus says, whatever you give, it will be pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I'm going to give all this back to you. Whatever you give... I'm going to give back to you. Is it your time that you're donating? Is it your love that you're donating? Are you stopping at the side of the road to help somebody change a tire? Well, guess what? Whatever it is that you're pouring out to people, you're going to get it back. Let's flip the switch, though. Whatever you're pouring out to people, you're going to be getting back. That's God's principle. If you're giving love, you're getting love. If you're giving hate, you're getting hate. If you're rude, mean, arrogant, that's what you're going to get back. What you give is what you're going to receive, but it's going to be a whole lot more dumped onto you. We don't want to think of it like that, do we? No, nobody wants to think of it like that. We only want to take the good things that God's saying, the things that are going to make us feel good and make us feel happy. That's what we want to be pressed down, shaken together, and running over in our life. 
But whatever you give is what you're going to get back. That's why it's so important to live by God's principles, to love people like he loves us. You know, Jesus says in John 17, he says that the world will know that Jesus was sent from the Father God here by the way that me and you, we love each other. That's the way the world's going to know. By the way, we love each other because Jesus knew the world doesn't love each other. The world wants what's best for the world and not what's best for you, but he wants you to live those kingdom principles and give everything that you have, the love, the good, the kindness, everything that you have to give to one another, to give to one another. We want to skip over the stuff in in Acts where it's talking about the church of Acts and everybody sold everything and gave to one another and it says that everyone had more than enough. It kind of goes against our American roots a little bit. It kind of rubs us wrong a little bit every now and then. We're like, well, this is mine. But it does say it in the Word that they took care of each other. To lend without asking for anything in return. To lend without taking a profit on it. So I need to have this talk with my bank, actually. We need to... We need to go over a few things because uh, the percentages that they're wanting in return is just not right. It's not adding up. It's biblical. It's biblical. Guys, let me talk to you for a second. <laughs> just, just hear me for a second. Come in the office. Let's, let's chat. In Matthew 13, 44 through 46, it says, The kingdom of heaven is like... I love when it says the kingdom of heaven is like. And I love to really get deep down into that and really actually hear from Jesus' mouth who's been in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, he's the king, you know what I mean? Like he's there. And he's telling us what it's like. He says, kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found and hid again. Good call, bud. And from joy over it, he had so much excitement, so much joy that he found this thing, that he goes and he sells all that he has, sells everything that he has, probably heirlooms and all of it, because it says all, and you can only assume that that means he sold it all. He sells everything that he has and buys that field. Why would that be so important? That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. You find it, and it's such a treasure that you're willing to get rid of everything else in your whole life for it. You're willing to let everything else go. Think about the friends whenever you became Christians, and they're like, I really don't want to have anything to do with you now. You let it go because the joy of salvation is so much better than those relationships. Those relationships, they weren't doing anything for you because they were selfish. These people are selfish because they're of the world. Well, we're in the world. We're not of the world, okay? We're we're travelers. We're sojourners passing through this place. We live in eternity. That's where we live. Right now, the breath that you're breathing... Believe it or not, you've got a spirit in you, and your spirit man is eternal, or your spirit woman is eternal, okay? We're just passing through. They sell everything and buy this field so that they can have this treasure that's so much greater than everything that they had. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant that seeks fine pearls. He's looking for fine pearls. That's what this dude does. It's his job. That's all he does. He's seeking for great pearls. And then all of a sudden, one day, God puts one in his path. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. He's driving this point home. He says it twice in a row because it's extremely important. The kingdom of heaven is better than anything you have. It's better than everything you have. It's better than everything you will ever have. It doesn't matter what you have. 
The kingdom of heaven is better. It's worth more. God tells you these things because he wants you to have the very best that you could possibly have. He wouldn't tell you this otherwise. He's not trying to trick you. He's not like, hey, go sell everything that you have. Follow after me. Ha <laughs> ha, gotcha, gotcha. No, that's not our God. Matthew 19, 23, and Jesus said to his disciples, truly, truly, yes, Jesus, we, we believe you. Truly, I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, why is it hard? Because he puts all of his faith, all of his trust. He can do anything that he wants because he can afford to do anything that he wants, not because God empowers him to do anything he wants. And he puts all of his faith, he holds on to that money because it's the only thing that gives him security. Well, don't we know that everything is going to rust? Moths are going to eat it. It's going to decay. It's going to go away. Everything of this earth. When I was growing up, I loved Lamborghinis. Anybody else love Lamborghinis? Those are the baddest cars on the planet. Azrael, I was taking her to school the other morning. There was this dark blue one with yellow accents, yellow calipers on the wheels. I mean, the thing had to have been a quarter of a million at least. And he was driving the slowest as everybody on the, you got the fastest car on the road. And I have the slowest car on the road. And I'm passing a Lamborghini. Like, this is not the way it's supposed to be, bud. You're supposed to smoke past me, and I'm supposed to go, wow. But I digress. So imagine you've got every Lamborghini on the planet, and you can buy all of them again if you want. It doesn't make any difference in the kingdom of heaven. You can have it all, and one day, that breath is going to leave your body. And somebody else is going to have your Lambos. <laughs> and they're going to drive them slow. I bet. Seriously, though, think about it. It doesn't matter how much wealth you get here on this earth. And if life is but a vapor, it's here today and gone tomorrow. Why are we focused on that? Why do we spend day in and day out worrying about money. What in the world? It doesn't make any sense. Why don't we focus on what's going to last forever? What's going to be eternal? Why? Why? Because people tell us all day, every day, that this other crap is important. And it's not. It's not. I'm here to tell you it's not. It's not worth it. It's not worth your time. It's not worth your thought. It's not worth your worry, your struggle, wondering if you're going to get by. If you want to get by, then focus on your Father in heaven who wants to give you everything that you need according to His riches and His glory. He says you're not your provider. You're not your provider. He says, I am. I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. What he wants is you to have a giving heart, not a hoarding heart. Because why? Because he wants you to be like him. He is good, he is kind, he is loving, he's generous. He laid his life down for us. He wants you to be like him. And you know what? The Bible says that he went and created us in his image and in his likeness. So if you want to be like him, be like him. Give like him. Love like him. He gives it all. There's nothing he hasn't given. He even gave you his own son. He literally took everything that was bad, your sins and your shame and your guilt, and he threw it as far as the east is from the west. He wants you to turn into this loving, giving person that gives everything. He's extravagant. 
he presented to them another parable. This is Matthew 13, 31 through 43, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed, planted. Sowed means planted. It doesn't mean he sowed it onto one of Elvis Presley's suits with all those bedazzled things. It means planting. He planted it. He watered it. He took care of it. It's this tiny little seed planted in a field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, Jesus says. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. You know what he's talking about here? I think I see that little tiny little mustard seed and I see Nathan, me. I see this little person that in my own human mind, without God, I see is very insignificant. It's amongst a millions and millions of other mustard seeds. How am I supposed to make a difference? But he says this farmer takes this seed and he plants it. The seed has to die. The seed is dead. And the farmer puts it in the ground, gives it the nutrients that it needs, the water that it needs. He took care of it. He could have thrown it out on the sidewalk somewhere. Could have been trampled under feet, but he didn't. He put it in the ground, and he took care of it and gave it everything that it needed. And then this little insignificant thing that was surrendered to the Father grows up, and all of a sudden produces fruit, it produces shade, it gives and it gives and it gives and it gives so much more than the little teeny tiny insignificant thing, all because the Father did the things to it. The Father gave it what it needs. God gives you what you need. He says that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. If you want to be this big, beautiful thing, then die. Die to yourself. Let me take over. Let me do with you what I want. If you ever ask yourself, God, why did you even create me? I want you to hear my voice. It's so that you'll die. So that he can make you live into all the things that he wants you to be, that he's designed and created you to be. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. We're all like, man, it's so difficult to be a Christ follower. People don't like me. People make fun of me. People call me names. It's, it's difficult. What if, what if somebody does this or that? People in other countries are like, what if I get my head cut off? What if I get tortured to death? Well, I equate that to like Moses, right? He strikes the rock instead of speaking to it, and God says, well, because of that, buddy, you got to die. You don't get to go into the promised land. He goes to heaven instead of the promised land. <laughs> really? Really? You didn't have to go battle with Joshua and everybody else forever? But Jesus, God came down. You know that, that Moses didn't go into the promised land, but it says, who buried Moses? God came down. God himself came down and buried Moses' body, and no one knows where it is. With care, he buried his body. God himself came and buried his body. Why do we look at Moses not going into the promised land like a bad thing, like him dying is a bad thing? Because we hear that one little thing, he wasn't obedient. He wasn't obedient. I'm telling you, there's so many times where I'm not obedient. There's also so many times where you're not obedient. But God loves you so much, and he will come and take care of you. He will come and take care. He did come and take care of you. He sent his son, and he gave his Holy Spirit to literally live and dwell inside you. That's how much he loves you. He loves you so much that he comes and gets inside you. <laughs> he 
because he loves you so that's how close he wants to be. He wants to be so close that he's literally inside. And he says he's your helper. He will help you do everything. He will help you do it. He's going to reveal all things to you, show you all things, things that are hidden. He will show you. He will reveal to you. I'm like, thank you so much. Where were you when I was in school? That would have been, that would have been great. <laughs> but no, seriously, that's who he is. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. Kingdom principles. There's a lot more principles, but those were just some of the main ones that I wanted to point out. I want you to remain kingdom-minded. Have that kingdom mindset all the time. Don't let God slip out of your vision, okay? Don't let him go out of your, out of your head. That's why in, in the Old Testament, they would tell him to write his word on your heart. They like wrote on, scriptures on stuff and put it on their bodies and stuff. My wife, she puts scriptures all over the house. I haven't told you, but I really love that. Thank you for doing that. Because I always read them. I'm like, man, that's, that's so cool. There's sticky notes and stuff. In the weirdest place, you open the cabinet. Oh, hey, cool. It reminds me all the time that God loves me and my wife loves me. You know, she loves me so much that she keeps his word in front of my face. It's awesome. Salvation is one of those kingdom principles. God wants to give you the keys to the kingdom. He loves you. Love is a kingdom principle. Forgiveness and giving, those are kingdom principles. We're going to go ahead and close. I'll put this back for Jesse for next week. <laughs> He's I like, leave it where it is, please. All right, tonight, today, this morning, whatever it is, this morning, I want you guys to... Really just close your eyes and think for a second. I want you to picture yourself in God's kingdom because that's where he sees you. Picture yourself as loving, as saved, as forgiven, and someone who forgives. Picture yourself as someone who gives extravagantly of themselves, of everything that they are. I want you to see yourselves the way God sees you. I want you to see yourselves the way he's created you to be. Like him. With him. I want you to trust that you're not lost, that you are found, and you're found in Him. You're found by Him. You're found through Him. You're found to Him. You are found. And you look like Him. You look like God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's who you are. Made for a relationship. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you that you care about us. Thank you that you are for us and you are not against us. Thank you for giving us everything and for giving us for everything so that we can be with you where you are forever. Father, help us to lose ourselves in the light of your glory, in the light of your grace. Help us to lay everything that we have at your feet. Help us to surrender everything that our, our earthly physical bodies and minds are, Lord, and help us to relinquish it all to you. Help us to give ourselves up wholly and completely to you, God to carry out what it is that you have for us. And we pray these things in your mighty son, Jesus' name, Lord. God, we want to thank you so much as the church body of 
Church on the Rock, Harrisonville. Thank you, Lord, for bringing uh, Matthew through this brain surgery. I thank you, God, that Rod and, and Glenna got to be with him during this time. Thank you, Lord, that you are continuing to heal him completely, that he's restored in the name of Jesus. I thank you that he is going to accomplish more for your kingdom now than he ever has before, God. I thank you that his trust and his love for you will go grow greater and brighter, Lord, and that lives will be changed because of him and because of your mercy, because of your grace over him, God. And I pray that he will impact the kingdom of God and steal souls out of the fire and add to your numbers in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.